This video is sponsored by Incogni, a personal information removal service. In a world, where all of us are compelled to use many applications and services, like Google or Facebook, without being aware of the dangers hidden behind them, Incogni provides you with a service, that would keep your personal data safe. Although all these services are free, they are also an open window for your personal data to be collected by data brokers, who aggregate your personal information, including your names and aliases, social security number, login credentials, home address, location history, online activity and much more, to create an intrusive portrait about you, and sell it to companies for marketing purposes. In this way, as your personal data becomes available for purchase by businesses, it eventually could be abused, or even fall into the hands of criminals. For example, have you ever received spam calls and wondered how they got your phone number? Data brokers, routinely sell phone numbers to companies building call lists, resulting in unwanted robocalls. The good news is, that you can stop it. There are currently three main laws that govern the protection of data privacy and mandate brokers to delete your data on request, the Californian CCPA, the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR laws, so you have the right to protect your privacy and request that data brokers, to delete the information they hold about you. However, the bad news is, that it would take you years to do it manually, just once, and you'd need to repeat the process every few months, as data brokers continue collecting your data, and creating new records. So, here is where Incogni comes in. The Incogni team will contact data brokers on your behalf, to request your personal data to be removed from their databases. Besides, Incogni will also take care that your data stays off the market, by conducting repeated removal requests. To get started with Incogni, simply go to the link in the description below and sign up using my discount code, FTB Deal. The first 100 people to use my code, will get 60% off. Shortly after 10 pm, on the night of July 9, 1943, the invasion of Sicily began, in a not so encouraging way, when the vast aerial armada, carrying the glider infantry of the 1st Air Landing Brigade of the British 1st Airborne Division, arrived over the island from the southeast. By the time the glider force approached Sicily, the summer storm that caused problems for the invasion fleet near Malta the previous day, still raged over Sicily. The inexperienced pilots, faced strong headwinds that, besides heavy ground fire from Italian anti-aircraft batteries, forced them to move away from their flight paths and the landing zones, which inevitably resulted in catastrophe. Out of about 147 gliders assigned for Operation Ladbrook, that departed from Tunisia, towed by C-47s of the United States Air Force's 51st Troop Carrier Wing, only 59 gliders landed on Sicily, of which 12 landed on, or near the correct landing zones in the vicinity of the Ponte Grand Bridge, while the rest crashed into the sea. The full extent of the disaster, remained unknown until the morning, which revealed that the 2,075 men strong British contingent, suffered over 500 casualties, of whom 252 drowned. Many who landed in the sea, including the 1st Airborne Division's commander, General George Hopkinson and his staff, were saved by the arriving Allied ships of the invasion armada, while others swam ashore, or ended up captured by Italian patrol ships. In the meantime, Despite the disastrous turn of events, the small groups of paratroopers who did manage to land on the island, swiftly began harassing the Italians by cutting telephone lines, ambushing patrols and attacking other targets of opportunity. One such party, of 26 paratroopers led by Lieutenant Louis Withers, landed in a glider near their primary target, Ponte Grand Bridge, which was captured intact after a short but fierce combat. Throughout the night, this tiny force was reinforced by other scattered paratroopers, including one American, who made their way to the bridge and by the time dawn arrived, about 87 men were defending the bridge, against the imminent Italian counterattack, which came at about 8 am. For over seven hours, the heavy battle raged and casualties mounted, as the British were repeatedly attacked by superior Italian force from the 75th Infantry Regiment of Napoli Division, supported by mortars and armored cars, until about 3.30 p.m., 
when the remaining 15 unwounded paratroopers, finally ran out of ammunition, and surrendered. However, their bravery and determination paid off, as only a half hour later, the advanced elements of the 5th Division, from the 2nd Battalion of Royal Scots Fusiliers, stormed the bridge, quickly overcoming already exhausted Italians, and widely opening the path to Syracuse. Meanwhile, in the American sector, at about midnight, the first paratroopers of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, from the 82nd Airborne Division, descended into darkness. The American drop that spearheaded the 7th Army landings codenamed Husky One, passed somehow better than the British. However, the Americans also encountered the strong winds, which, in combination with the inexperienced air crews, of approximately 266 C-47 aircraft from the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing, resulted in dispersed paradrop. Only about 15% of the paratroopers, roughly an equivalent of three companies, had landed near their intended drop zones, and the others scattered over the vast area of southern Sicily, with some, even landing in the British sector, with the majority being dropped into the 45th Division invasion sector, in front of Sent Beach. Despite these initial problems, nearly all American paratroopers landed safely, but they were so dispersed, that they posed no significant threat as a fighting force. Nevertheless, the paratroopers, grouped into small raiding parties of platoon strength or less, caused considerable havoc among German and Italian defenders, disrupting communication lines and troop movement all along the Sicilian coast. The sporadic and scattered outbursts of fighting, between the American paratroopers and the weak Italian coastal units, appeared to the Axis like they were facing a much larger and more powerful force, which contributed to the confused Axis reaction to the landings, in the American sector on the morning of July 10. Shortly after the airborne assault, in the early hours of July 10, the amphibious assault began, when the men of the 1st Special Raiding Squadron of the 2nd Special Air Service Regiment, landed on the Sicilian shore with the task to destroy coastal batteries on Cape Murra di Porco, at the northern edge of Acid Beach, the No. 3rd Commando had to do the same with the coastal battery near Cassibile. While the numbers 40 and 41 Royal Marine Commandos, had to secure the extreme left flank of the 8th Army's landing area. The SAS raiders, completed their task with ease, encountering only sporadic resistance and managing on the way, to rescue many airborne troops captured by Italians only hours ago. In the meantime, commandos of the No. 3 Commando, encountered much stiffer resistance while carrying on their task, which they completed without suffering any casualties, silencing the coastal battery, just a couple of minutes ahead of the main amphibious assault, which began simultaneously, on all beaches before the first daylight, at 2.45 am. Compared to many other amphibious operations, which were preceded by heavy naval bombardment, the naval artillery preparation for the invasion of Sicily, was probably the weakest of them all, and despite the modest naval shelling, and all other risks associated with the amphibious assault, the knowledge that they would soon come ashore, regardless of how heavy defense would be, brought huge relief to many allied soldiers, who had by then, suffered from severe seasickness after spending hours crowded on the ships at the rough sea. In the British 13th Corps sector, designated as Acid Beach, on the left flank of the Allied beachhead, the 5th Infantry Division, despite the usual difficulties accompanying the amphibious assaults, landed nearly on schedule. Although missing the assigned beach, the 5th Division made good progress inland, and aside from shelling from the naval base in Syracuse, that was swiftly suppressed by naval gunfire, they encountered weak resistance from the 146th Regiment of the Italian 206th Coastal Division, of which most of them who guarded the beach defences, surrendered or deserted. The main objective of the 5th Infantry Division, was the seizure of the ports of Syracuse and Augusta, crucial for the interrupted supply of the advancing Allied armies on Sicily. However, the Syracuse-Augusta area, was the most massively fortified defensive position in all of Sicily, consisting of at least 23 coastal defense batteries, dozens of reinforced bunkers, miles of barbed wire and minefields. After securing the intact Ponte Grand Bridge in the afternoon, largely thanks to the rigid defense of the small band from the 1st Air Landing Brigade, the spearhead of the 5th Division, marched into Syracuse on the evening of July 10th, 
finding it abandoned and the port undamaged. The city was quickly occupied, and the 5th continued its advance northward on a two-brigade front towards Augusta, where they were halted by the Kompfgruppe Schmaltz from Ponzer Division Hermann Göring, and the elements of Napoli Division, in the early hours of July 11. Further south, the 50th Division encountered considerable difficulties, as they were supposed to land amid heavy seas on the beaches near Ovola, which were unsuitable for the amphibious operation, as a coastline was littered with cliffs. As a result, the men of the 50th Division, landed in scattered groups on the wrong beaches in considerable disarray, which would ultimately end in disaster, if the Italian defences were slightly stronger. Luckily for them, the opposition encountered was equally disordered and symbolic. Despite chaotic landings, by 10 a.m., the 50th Division established a firm beachhead, having taken its primary objective, the town of Ovola, with a population of 22,000, where they encountered a group of some 75, utterly lost American paratroopers, who had been engaged in street fighting during the night, and most of the morning. The landings of the 30th Corps, took place on the beaches designated as Bark, on either side of the Pekino Peninsula, in the area defended by the 122nd Regiment of the Italian 206th Coastal Division. On the 30th Corps' right flank, the 231st Brigade, which had been in Malta throughout the siege, was tasked to maintain the contact between the 13th and 30th Corps, landed fairly close to its assigned beach designated as Bark East, just off the village of Marzamemi on the Pekino Peninsula, about two kilometers northeast of Pekino town. The Bark East Beach, consisted of strongly fortified positions, and unlike other beaches in the 8th Army's zone, the defense encountered here, was much stiffer. However, Despite inevitable confusion accompanying night landings, the men of the 231st Brigade, quickly put out of action several Italian strongpoints after determined attacks, capturing large numbers of Italian soldiers in the process. The landings of the 51st Division on Bark South Beach, were preceded by rockets and naval gunfire, which convinced the Italians manning the coastal defences, to run for safety. Therefore, the British troops on Bark South, met negligible opposition, and pressed inland swiftly through the town of Pekino and further west. On the southwestern side of the Pekino Peninsula, backed up with numbers 40th and 41st Royal Marine Commandos, the 1st Canadian Division, landed on Bark West Beach with modest delays. Again, like on the other beaches of the 8th Army sector, Canadians met only sporadic machine gun fire on the way to shore, and once landing craft reached the coast, the Italian defenders, not so eager to fight, decided to call it a day and pulled back. Throughout the peninsula, Italian troops surrendered rather than offer any resistance, and as the Canadian and British troops advanced inland, they discovered large quantities of artillery and other equipment, simply abandoned. By the end of the day, the 1st Canadian Division, completed all its assigned tasks, including the seizure of Pekino Airfield, one of the main objectives of D-Day, and proceeded inland with two brigades in line, fighting only minor skirmishes against isolated pockets of resistance, taking many prisoners and suffering modest casualties along the way. In his headquarters on Malta, General Bernard Montgomery, the 8th Army's commander, anxiously awaited the first news from Sicily, and the first reports arriving from the beachhead, calmed Montgomery, as the success of the 8th Army landings had exceeded his wildest expectations. The results of the first day of Operation Husky in the British sector, have been astonishing. By mid-morning, after overcoming a minimum of resistance, the four divisions, the 231st Brigade, the SAS and the Commandos, were safely ashore in Sicily. And, with the beachhead now secured, engineers and bulldozers, Blast in a passage through the beaches, which were now jammed with disembarking tanks, artillery, vehicles, and increasingly large masses of other equipment. Meanwhile, the American landings in the Gulf of Geller, faced significantly more resistance from both ground and air forces, than encountered on the British beaches, but again, not seriously enough to disrupt the assault. The landing proved slightly harder to carry out on rough water, since the 7th Army landing areas on southern beaches, were not sheltered from the wind and were more exposed, to the remnants of the previous day's storm. 
on the right flank of the 7th Army's beachhead, some 30 kilometers from the Canadians in the Pequeno Peninsula, the American 45th Infantry Division, landed on the beach designated as Sent, in the area defended by the 178th Regiment of the 18th Independent Coastal Brigade. And while the 179th and 180th Regiments, despite sporadic shelling from the Italian coastal batteries, came ashore, close to their assigned beaches in considerable disorder, the 3rd Division's Regiment, the 157th, stranded on the rock-covered coast at Point Braxetto, some 15 kilometers east of the rest of the division, in complete disarray, with two landing craft capsized on a rough sea, drowning 27 men, and for the remainder of the day, the 157th Regiment, operated virtually as an independent task force and fought their way inland the best they could. The landing of the 45th Infantry Division, could have been an even greater tragedy, if the Italian howitzer battery overlooking the Sent beaches had ammunition, but they did not, so they left for home, as did most of the other Italian coastal gunners along the Sicilian coast. Fortunately for the men of the 45th Division, most paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division, landed in front of Sent Beach, and small groups of scattered paratroopers, had been harassing the Italian infantry for hours before the amphibious landings occurred. After overcoming problems accompanying difficult landing, and following successful organizing on the beach in their first combat action, by the end of the day, the 45th Divisions advanced some 10 kilometers inland, seizing the town of Victoria without the fight, as the garrison surrendered as soon as the first American troops arrived there. Meanwhile, the leading companies of the 157th Regiment, entered Ragusa further east, where they stayed for the night, to await the arrival of Canadians. On the western end of the 7th Army Zone, the 3rd Infantry Division landed on Joss Sector, near Lee Carter, in an area guarded by the 139th Coastal Regiment, from the 207th Coastal Division. The 7th Regiment, came ashore on the beaches to the west, to protect the left flank of the American beachhead, while the 15th Regiment, supported by the 3rd Ranger Battalion, came ashore at each side of Lee Carter, and advanced from two directions, aiming to capture the town in a pincer movement. The 30th Regiment, landed further east, tasked to establish contact with the neighboring 1st Infantry Division at Dime Beach. Except for artillery and sporadic machine gun fire, the 3rd Division encountered negligible resistance, while quickly advancing inland, and by mid-morning, Lee Carter was in American hands. Before evening, the 3rd Division advanced more than 10 kilometers inland, and accomplished its mission of protecting the 7th Army's left flank, establishing a firm beachhead and capturing nearly 3,000 prisoners, while supplies and reinforcements were pouring in, through the recently captured port. For what he considered, to be the heaviest task of the entire Operation Husky, the landings in the center of the American sector, Patton assigned the 7th Army's most experienced division, the 1st, and especially for this purpose assembled Provisional Ranger Unit, designated as Force X, consisting of the 1st and 4th Rangers. The 1st Infantry Division, also known as Big Red 1, named after its red number 1 on the division shoulder patch, was the oldest active division of the U.S. Army, and now, just as it would do in a little less than one year, during Operation Overlord, the division had the task of carrying out the most difficult landings of the invasion of Sicily, the one on Dime Sector, directly on the port of Gela. Unlike the Joss Sector, the coast to the west of Gela, was covered with cliffs topped with gun batteries, leaving the only landing place to a narrow stretch of the beach to the east, and at Gela itself. Therefore, the 1st Division, couldn't employ the same tactics of a pincer movement as the 3rd Division did on Lee Carter. The attack on Gela, defended by the 134th Regiment of the 18th Independent Coastal Brigade, spearheaded by Rangers of Force X, under Lieutenant Colonel William Darby, began about an hour later than planned, and once Rangers hit the shore, they were instantly involved in the fight, which proved much tougher than initially expected. The Italian opposition in town, was much more spirited than elsewhere in Sicily, mainly because the Italians in Gela, were already engaged in a fierce fight against paratroopers for most of the night, so rangers, landed amidst ongoing battle, and immediately they came under intense crossfire from the Italian troops concealed in two pillboxes, 
losing almost an entire platoon before they cleared the town at 8 a.m., after nearly four hours of combat. Meanwhile, harassed by the shelling from the coastal batteries, which were all but one, that remained operational until the afternoon, destroyed by the naval gunfire, the 26th and 16th regiments of the 1st Division, came ashore on their assigned beaches to the east of the Gela, facing far less resistance than expected. However, the landing site of the 1st Division, was heavily mined, resulting in several vehicles ending up destroyed. Once the port of Gela was secure, Big Red 1 proceeded towards their primary objective, the Ponte Olivo airfield some 10 kilometers inland, completely unaware that the bulk of the Hermann Goring Panzer Division, was heading towards them. And while the ground troops advanced inland, with much more ease than expected, facing only sporadic and weak resistance, with the first light of day, Luftwaffe and Regia Aeronautica's planes, appeared in the skies over the Allied invasion fleet. Given that the Allies had no aircraft carriers assigned for the protection of the invasion fleet, meant that only land-based fighter planes could protect the fleet, and they had to fly all the way from Malta, leaving landing beaches without constant fighter cover, which the German and Italian pilots, made more than good use of. The first victim of the Axis air strikes, came at 5 a.m., when a U-88 bomber, scored a direct bomb hit in the ammunition magazine of USS Maddox, the destroyer on anti-submarine patrol south of Geller, which was sunk within minutes, with a loss of eight officers and 203 hands, being the fastest sinking U.S. warship lost during the war. Only minutes later, a minesweeper, USS Sentinel, was severely damaged by a series of air attacks and sank shortly after, with a loss of 10 dead and 51 wounded. During the first day only, the Luftwaffe carried out 370 sorties, and the Italian Air Force an additional 141 missions, mainly in the Gulf of Gela, while suffering relatively small losses, and the attack continued in the following days. The most spectacular naval casualty, was the Liberty ship Robert Rowan, loaded with ammunition, which was hit by several bombs in the late afternoon of July 11, that vanished in a tremendous explosion, which tore the ship apart. By the end of the battle, Allied naval losses in Sicily, eventually totaled 48,685 tons of shipping and material, most of which were small coastal vessels, landing craft and merchantmen, while the Axis, had lost 146 aircraft. Meanwhile, throughout the night, reports began pouring into the 6th Italian Army headquarters in Enna, and the first news about the invasion, came as no surprise to its commander, General Gazzoni, who anticipated for days, an inevitable Allied invasion of Sicily. However, the reports arriving in the 6th Army headquarters, were often contradictory and came late, since the well-trained Allied paratroopers cut most of the telephone lines, and disrupted communications all over southeast Sicily. Therefore, Gazzoni, lacking a clear picture of the true situation on the ground, was completely unaware that his coastal defenses began disintegrating, as soon as the first Allied soldier, set foot on Sicily. Considering the American landings at Gela, as the main Allied thrust, far more dangerous than the British landings around Syracuse, he decided to stick to his plan to commit his reserves, and organize counter-attacks on the most critical sectors. Immediately, he assigned the divisions of the 6th Army's mobile reserve to the 16th Corps, ordering its commander, General Rossi, to send Kompfgruppe from Ponza Division Hermann Goering, under Colonel Wilhelm Schmaltz and the Napoli Division, to reinforce immediately threatened naval bases at Augusta and Syracuse, and prevent the Allied thrust into the plain of Catania, while at the same time, ordering him to launch a main counterattack against the Americans at Gela, with the bulk of Hermann Goring Division, and Livorno Division. Rossi reacted quickly, and at about 5 a.m., he dispatched the 16th Corps Reserve, a battalion-sized task force designated as Mobile Group E, towards Gela, while approximately at the same time, he ordered Livorno Division, to send its nearest unit, the 3rd Battalion of the 33rd Infantry Regiment, to attack Americans from the west. Unfortunately for the Italians, urgency prevented them from grouping their forces, so both units, moved towards Gela from two directions, without any coordination. Mobile Group E, equipped with about 30 French-made R-35 light tanks and supported by motorized infantry, 
advanced in a column along State Highway 117, when they ran into the ambush set by about 100 American paratroopers from the 1st Battalion, of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, who had established a roadblock near Priolo. Once the Italian column approached within about 150 meters, paratroopers opened a devastating fire, destroying the three leading vehicles within minutes, as are 35 light tanks, captured by Germans following the fall of France back in 1940, and handed over to Italy, weighing just 10 tons, and armed with one 37mm gun and one 7.5mm machine gun, were hopeless against pretty much any American anti-tank weapons. Following initial surprise, the Italians pulled back beyond small arms range, and began shelling the American positions, forcing paratroopers to withdraw, just in time as naval artillery shells began falling, called down by the approaching men from the 16th Regiment of the 1st Division. Between 8 o'clock and 12.55, the light cruisers USS Savannah and Boise, and the destroyers USS Shubrick and Jeffers, fired more than 500 152mm shells and hundreds more 127mm shells, suppressing the Italian infantry with a devastating fire and destroying their tanks one by one. The five surviving tanks, managed to enter Geller without any infantry support, where three of them were disabled or destroyed, in a wild battle against Derby's rangers on the town's narrow streets. After suffering heavy losses, the remnants of Mobile Group E withdrew in disorder. At about the same time, some 600 inexperienced Italian infantrymen of the Livorno Division marched across the plain closely packed in almost parade ground fashion to attack Geller from the west, when they ran at the positions held by Ranger Force, reinforced with some captured Italian field guns. Bunched up in the fields outside Geller, the Italians were torn to pieces by American rifle, machine gun and mortar fire, and after having suffered enormous casualties without reaching the outskirts of town, the Italian survivors fell back. In both of these attacks, the Italian troops displayed great bravery, although with a lack of tactical skill, and if they had any help from Germans, they could inflict significant damage to Americans, retake Geller, or even throw back into the sea, a sizable part of the 7th US Army. Meanwhile, the inexperienced and poorly led men, of the Hermann Goering Division, took hours to organize a counter-attack, on the heart of the American beachhead, and although their preparations began while it was still night, it was not until the afternoon, that they had been ready for the attack. By then, the Americans had already fortified their defensive positions, and had plenty of men and materials on the shores of Sicily. General Paul Conrath, Hermann Goering Division's commanding officer, planned to attack Geller Beachhead from two directions, and he decided to split his forces into two Kampfgruppe, violating in his arrangement, all the principles of combined arms operations, leaving the bulk of his tank force without adequate infantry support, while at the same time, leaving his infantry with very few tanks. For Kampfgruppe Wright, which was to advance from the west, he assigned the Panzer Regiment with a recon company attached, two heavy battalions, and the engineer battalion. The second task force, designated as Kampfgruppe Left, consisted of the Panzer Grenadier Regiment, and the Tiger Tanks Company, and was to approach Geller from the east some 15 kilometers away. At about 2 p.m., Kampfgruppe Wright, advanced over the same path as Mobile Group E, took a few hours ago and bumped into American defensive positions, where they were halted near Priolo, by the elements of the 16th Regiment, reinforced with paratroopers, and supported by artillery from ships offshore. Faced with devastating naval gunfire, the Germans quickly fell back, partially because of incompetence and poor leadership. Conrath, who accompanied the Western Column, immediately relieved Kampfgruppe's commander, Colonel Urban on the spot, and he personally took charge of the task force, but again, his efforts at getting the attack back on track, were fruitless. Farther east, the Kampfgruppe left advanced in the 45th Division's zone, where their attack was quickly halted, by a relatively small force from the 1st Battalion of the 180th Regiment, and a handful of paratroopers, by then well organized, and positioned in dense olive groves, which restricted the movements of the Tiger tanks. To make matters worse, some Tigers suffered mechanical problems and broke down, 
blocking the others and slowing down the armored advance. To assess the situation on the left flank, at about 4 p.m., Conrath sent his chief of staff, Lieutenant Colonel Helmut Bergengruen, who retook the command over the Kompfgruppe, and under his leadership, the Germans, slowly began to gain ground. After a fierce fight, advancing with the remaining operational Tigers up front, and the infantry right behind, Kompfgruppe left, overran the 1st Battalion of the 180th Regiment, taking most of its men, including its commander, prisoner. Shortly after, the Germans reached the 3rd Battalion's positions, and when it seemed that the 180th Regiment, was on the brink of being destroyed, and that the 45th Division's line, was about to be penetrated, the Germans broke contact and withdrew. Shortly after, realizing that the counterattack had failed, Conrath called off his troops, and decided to try again the next day, despite the objections of General Gazzoni, who insisted on continuing with counterattacks during D-Day, if at all possible, although he, by then, already knew, that the fate of Sicily, had been sealed. And once again, big thanks to Incogni for sponsoring this video, and do not forget to click the link in the description below, to get an exclusive Incogni deal. Enter promo code FDBDEAL, and the first 100 people to use this code, will get 60% off.